All right, hello and welcome back to Windows Local Persistence Part 2. Uh, yesterday I did Part 1. It actually dropped this morning, so I think well, I'm, my goal is to make this also drop the same day, so you should have had the other video this morning. You have this one by this evening, depending on what time zone you're in. And uh, we covered these tasks, these um, the introduction obviously, but we did the... Uh, unprivileged account task, backdooring uh, files, abusing services, and scheduled tasks. And now we're going to go through log on uh, triggered persistence, as well as uh, what else we got? We got um, backdooring the login screen with RDP and persisting through existing services. And uh, so this one that we're on right now is a pretty, pretty big one. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, we're just going to jump into it. This is part of the Pentest Plus pathway, and this is a subscriber-only room. So if you want to get access to this, you need to have a paid membership, a VIP subscription, as they call it. You can use the link in the description below to get a discount on your paid membership and uh, begin your hacking activities or your hacktivities, and you get access to all of the VIP and subscriber-only rooms as well. Uh, which is, in my opinion, it's very, very worth it because it's pretty inexpensive to get. So uh, this is definitely one of those things that ends up being a good investment towards your skill set. And then if you just want to follow along in your own machine, you're also more than welcome to do that uh, as long as you are able to get both a Linux machine, because that's what our attack box is, as well as a Windows machine. And of course, you could do that through virtual machines, so on and so forth. And so uh, if you just want to follow along, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Just make sure that you like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell so that you get notified the next time a video comes out in this pathway. And that way you will be up to date and you can follow along with us with our hacktivities and all the new videos that come out. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the logon triggered persistence. So um, each user has a folder under this tab right here, right? So you basically have users, the username, then there's app data, roaming Microsoft Windows, start menu programs, and then the startup folder. And you can put executables to be run whenever the user logs in on startup, right? So we can achieve persistence by dropping a payload in this folder. And if we want to force all users to run a payload while logging in, you can use the program data. So instead of going to users, so on and so forth, the program data, Microsoft Windows, start menu, da, da, da. So it's the same thing, except it's just a different path. And so for this task, we're going to create our uh, payload using MSF Venom, create a Python server, transfer it through PowerShell. Although uh, when I tried to use wget, it didn't work. I'm going to try wget again. So maybe this time around, I think I used wget uh, inside the command prompt and not inside PowerShell. So maybe it'll work in PowerShell. And then so you'll download the payload onto the Windows machine, uh, which reminds me, I should actually get these two started so that while we're reading through this information, we can kind of just make sure that we have that actually loading in the background. Uh, so you create your payload, you transfer it to the Windows machine, and then you, uh, you copy it into the startup uh, menu or startup directory, excuse me. And this is the startup directory right here, or excuse me, I'm sorry, this is not the startup, this is the start menu, my bad. So it's not the startup uh, menu. You transfer it into that directory, and then uh, you have to sign out and then sign back in um, so that you can actually re-instantiate or essentially just restart your session. So when you do that, it should automatically give you an RDP to the attack box uh, because essentially we're creating a reverse shell. They don't say it right here, but we do need to create a netcat listener so that uh, once we have the netcat listener on our attack box, it'll start the reverse shell to that and then we'll be able to get access to flag number 10. And then that was the, the first exercise. Then we're going to do the run and run once exercise. And so you can force somebody to execute a program on logon via the registry. And so we've already done the registry editor several times. So you should be familiar to this. And there are these uh, uh, directories inside the registry, uh, which is under HKCU and HKLM. They both have run and run once. 
And so instead of delivering it into a specific, you can deliver it in the registry entries to specify applications to run at logon. And then the registry under HKCU will only apply to the current user, so CU, and then LM will apply to everyone. I believe it stands for local machine. So any program specified under run, keys will uh, run every time that the user logs on. Run once will only be executed a single time. So I guess what we're trying to do is we're going to put it into uh, run potentially so that it goes everyone every time that it logs on. So you create the payload using MSF Venom. We transfer it to the victim machine using Python uh, server. You already saw that, so we, we don't need to scroll up. Uh, and then once it's been transferred, you move the shell into the Windows directory that's on the root directory. So it's root and then Windows. Then you create a, a registry under HKLM for the local machine and run. Uh, so the entry's name can be anything that you want. And the value will be the command that we want to execute, which is the reverse shell command that's inside the Windows directory. And in a real world setup, you could use any name just when this task we're required to use my backdoor to receive the flag. So we got to create uh, the payload called my backdoor to be able to receive the flag. And then after doing this, you sign out of the sh session, sign back in again, and we should get the reverse shell for uh, flag 11. And then you have win logon, which is also in the HKLM registry and it goes under win logon directory and uh, user init points to user init exe which is in charge of restoring the profile preferences shell points to the system shell which usually explorer.exe so these are the two right here and so if we'd replace any of the executables with a reverse shell we would break the logon sequence, which is not desired. Interestingly, you can append commands, meaning add it to the end, separated by a comma, and when logon will process them all. So you see how there's a, it seems like there's a command already at the end of this already. There's a command right there. So uh, we're going to create the payload and then transfer it to the machine. Then we're going to move it into the Windows directory. Then uh, we can either add alter shell or user init and it's going to be inside this directory. In this case, we're going to use user init, but the procedure with shell is the same. Uh, while both shell and user init could be used to achieve persistence in a real world scenario, to get the flag, you will need to use user init, which is this thing right here. And so you're going to append it using a comma. So it runs the full thing, then you append it, and then you add the path for the shell, and then we'll get flag number 12 and then there's the logon script so user in it does uh it loads while loading your user profile to check for an environment called uh, it checks for an environment called the logon script and we can use this environment variable to assign a logon script to a user that will get run when logging into the machine the variable isn't set by default so we can just create it and assign any script that we want uh, each time that it has this and own variable uh, environment variable therefore you will need to backdoor each separately let's create a reverse shell to use this for the technique so there's the payload and then we'll transfer it to the machine then we copy it into the windows directory and uh, we'll to create the environment variable we're going to go into current user hkcu uh, environment and then use this script entry point to uh, point to our payload, which is this thing right here. And we could actually just add it to the data as the entire thing. And now uh, it says, notice that this registry has, key has no equivalent in HKLM, making your backdoor apply only to the current user. And then we're gonna get flag number 13 that way. So um, hopefully by now our machines have fully loaded up and we can start them up in our split view window. And so this is going to be, wow, it's taking a long time. <laughs> so I'm going to see if the attack box is all good. Let me see if I can open up the attack box in a new browser or a new tab. Okay, there's the attack box. Let's see if we can open up the window, the Windows machine in a new tab. And there you go. Okay, that's all good too. 
Um, so now, uh, essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to go back to the very top of this. Let me close that out because that's driving me crazy. And we're just going to start up with this task right here, right? So the first thing that we want to do is create our payload, which is going to happen here. And then uh, we're going to transfer it to the Windows machine and we'll take it from there. So I'm going to real quick just copy paste the command in here. Uh, same command that we've used in the part one of this video as well. So you, you should have seen this a few times already. If not, we'll do a quick review of it. Um, so it's an MSF Venom. So it's from Metasploit. It's an MSF Venom payload and it's a reverse shell payload. So the only thing that we have to do is just change the IP address to our local attack box, which is 190.155. And so it looks like this, right? So MSF Venom P for payload, Windows X64 shell reverse TCP, then the local host or the listening host. I think it's listening host, honestly. So listening host and then listening port. And then you're going to create an executable and you're going to output it to the name reverse shell.exe. And that's it. That's all you got to do to create the payload. And then you just press enter. It takes a few seconds for it to run. And then after that's done, we can transfer it to our uh, Windows machine. And so since we're here, let's just make sure that this thing is running. It just closed. OK, there we go. So we're going to start up PowerShell because we need PowerShell to run our wget command. And there you go. This is done. So it's been created. So now I'm just going to do a Python uh, server, which is Python M. Here we go. Python dash M HTTP server. You just press enter. It creates one. The default port that it does it on is port 8000. So you just need to make sure that that's what it's actually on. And so the IP address is 1010.190.155 at port 8000. And so I guess every time that I go to the other window, it just does that. So it's kind of annoying. But we're going to do wget and then the attack box 1010 uh, 190. Oops. 190, 155. Oh, great. So wget <laughs> HTTP 10, 10, 190, 155. There you go. At port 8000. And it's going to be called the. Uh, rev dash oh no rev shell dot exe rev shell dot exe and we want to output it to uh, rev shell dot exe it feels like this is going to be one of those days because this thing keeps doing that to me and so there you go we have the downloaded reverse shell which is perfect so now we are going to copy that reverse shell into our startup uh, menu as uh, the instructions said, right? Because we're doing the startup task right now. So um, I'm actually going to do it from command line because that's what they told us to do. So in command line, we're going to do copy uh, rev. Let's actually make sure that's in the same directory. It is. Is it here? It is right there. Great. So copy rev shell dot exe. Let me kind of bring this up a little bit and it's going to go inside the program data Microsoft. OK, there we go. We got the file copied and now should be all good. And so we can just restart the machine. So the only thing I got to do is I got to create a a uh, listener through Netcat and we just do that running and see for netcat lvp as the options and it's going to be on port 4450 that's what we use to create our original payload and so now we're just going to go down here and we're going to log out and log back in so right here sign out okay and we sign back in and we do have our reverse shell wonderful so the Flag is flag number 10, so we're just going to run it. Since it's an executable, you could just run it using the actual uh, full path, which is that. And then you run that, and then there you go. So no, no, after you, and that is the flag for flag number 10. So the next one that we're going to do is the run and run once uh, directories that are under the registry editor. So first, we're going to just create the... Uh, the 
reverse shell again and I think it's just going to be uh, is it the same thing it's literally the same thing so except I'm just gonna call it a new one so I'm just gonna call it reverse shell one dot exe uh, in this particular case it says that uh, in a real world you could use any name for your registry in this particular situation we have to create a registry called my backdoor so that's fine so the reverse shell could just be called whatever and it's going to be running on we'll use a different port just to make sure that that's all good because i don't want to mess it up just by having the same port so there you go so uh, same command to run the uh, reverse shell uh, the listener host is going to be our attack box, listener port, we changed it to 4455, and it's an exe, and it's going to output to reverse shell, there you go, and then while that's running, we're going to go back here, and we're going to reconnect to the Windows machine, that is extremely obnoxious at this point, because it keeps restarting, and look, it's doing it again, this is so annoying, I don't know what the hell is happening over here, but, uh, okay, there we go, so this is done, so now I can do a Python server, like the command that you already saw so there's that and that is serving serve so now let's see if this will stay up long enough for us to actually be able to download this thing wget http 10 10 1 90 155 i believe it is on port 8000 and now it's rev shell 1.exe not triple one rev shell 1.exe right there it is and let's just make sure that it is 191.55 correct so 191.55 ref shell one oh no it is ref shell one it just looks like there is the l's and the ones look very very similar in this situation and we're going to output it to uh, rev shell one dot exe okay there we go and if i do dir there should be the second shell excellent so now I need to move that shell into, uh, I'm, I'm going to use the command prompt for this. I need to move that shell into the Windows directory. So we're going to move ref shell onexe into C Windows. And there is that. So now what we can do is we can open up our registry editor. So we just go down here search for registry editor and we are going to need to go to the h key local machine and find the path that they want us to find which is uh, it's going to be software microsoft um, windows current version and run so it's going to be inside here and so now we're going to create a new item here so i think i could just do can I do create new? New, there we go. New, uh, do we want to create a new key? Yeah, so we need to create a reg expand uh, registry. And so it needs to be called uh, modify the data, not the binary, excuse me. We're going to modify the whole thing. And the value needs to be uh, my back door is what it needs to be called and then we're going to modify the data and the value data is going to be the path to our reverse shell just like that there you go so now we got that and so after doing this sign out of the current session and log in again and you should receive a shell which means that we got to go here first and we got to create the netcat listener one more time and it's on port 4455 and that is listening and so i'm gonna reconnect only to disconnect one more time click on the start menu down here and log out so sign out and try to reconnect uh it said that this one is going to take about 10 to 20 seconds so we're going to wait to see if in approximately oh there you go quickly nicely done and so there it is. So now we can get flag number 11. And there you go. Let me hold the door for you. That is flag number 11. 
And so we got that. And now we can move on to the next one, which is for win logon. And so win logon is also inside the registry editor. And we're going to be changing uh, what's under the registry for win logon. But again, the first thing that we got to do is we got to create a reverse shell. And it's exactly the same reverse shell that we're going to be using, which is this thing, except now I'm going to name it reverse shell two. And I'm going to change it from 4455, we're going to change it to 4452. All the other information stays the same. So while that's running, I'm going to open up registry editor, and I'm going to get to the path that we need to get to. There we go. And from here, we need to get to where it is it? It's the local machine. And there you go. It's going to be in software, Microsoft, uh, Windows and T and it'll be current version and win logon there we go this is where we're supposed to be and so there is shell which is one of the items that we can mess with and then there is the user in it and so for this particular example we're going to be using user in it so that's going to be the one that we're going to change and so by now the the payload should have been created on the other side and it is so what we're going to do is we're going to first download it using wget and ref shell 2 190 155 oh whoops i forgot to create the python server so you got to do that http.server and there's that and so whoops let's see if we can run the command one more time here and we got it so there it is and uh, I'm just going to do a dir just to make sure. And there it is, ref shell 2. And so now I'm going to go from the command line. I don't know why. I could probably do it inside PowerShell anyways. But we're going to just do command line because they told us to do it. And so now it's inside the Windows directory. And so now what we can do is we can go into the registry editor, into the path that we're at. And we're going to change the user init value. So we're just going to modify the data at the end right here. And all we're going to do is after this little comma, I think there's already a comma, but I'm just going to make sure that there's a comma. And I'm going to just type in the path, path to the uh, reverse shell. Just like that. And that's saved. And that's it. So just like that. And easy enough, right? It's, it's kind of crazy how it is. Easy it is. So now we're just going to go back here. We're going to create our netcat session and then uh, we're going to hopefully find the login when we log back out and log back in. So we created the netcat listener and just like that, you go here, sign out and reconnect. And there it is. Ladies and gentlemen, so we just run it, flags, flag 12.exe, and there it is. I insist you go first. So we are making pretty smooth progress over here. So the last one is for logon scripts, and I, you guessed it. We're going to go and run the same command to create another payload. And in this situation is going to be ref shell number three. And we're going to go to 4453 as our port, just to have a new port. Everything else stays exactly the same. The attack IP stays the same. And uh, the, the payload stays the same. All of this is the same. So, but now, since I'm here, I need to go ahead and create uh, a couple of these sessions right here, just to get it prepared for when our payload is finished. And once that is done, we're going to use the registry editor again. So there's the registry editor. And we need to go to where are we going this time? We're going to go to current user. So H key current user right here. And uh, it's going to be where are we going? We're going to go to environment. That's it right here. Easy enough. And uh, we will use the user init MPR logon script entry to point the payload to it. So we got to create a new one 
and it's going to be an expandable, etc., etc., etc. So this should already be done, and it is. So we're going to create a Python server. So Python 3 m HTTP server. Create that on port 8000. And make sure to we, to we reconnect to this freaking machine every single time that we do this. And so there it is. And so now we're going to go to wget HTTP. 1 uh, 10 10 190 155 on port 8000 and it's going to be ref shell 3.exe and it's going to be output to ref shell 3.exe just like that and if we do a direct reach call and there it is and it is indeed ref shell 3.exe voila so that's all good so i got a uh, I'm just going to do this now and then we're going to go finish the rest of the stuff. So it's going to be 4430, 4453, my bad. So now we have our netcat listener running already. So we're just going to kind of play ahead of the game and then go to the command prompt and move rev shell, move rev shell 3.exe to Windows directory. And that has been moved. And so now we can go back here. And now we can create a new expandable string. And it's going to be called user init mpr. Whoops, not mp4. mpr logon script. User init mpr logon script. And it's expandable. And now we're just going to modify the data, which is basically the value. And it's going to point to our Windows rev shell 3.exe. That's it. Just like that. Notice that this has no... Uh, okay, so it's not in the local machine. It has to be in the current user, which is exactly where we are. Of course, it needs to be reconnected again. And after doing this, sign out of your current session and log in again. So that's basically the process here and netcat is already running so we're good on that so we just got to go here and sign out and sign back in and we should have our reverse shell for the flag number 13 yeah flag number 13. there you go easy does it so c flags and flag 13.exe and there we go user uh, triggered user user triggered persistence ftw <laughs> fuck the world um, so there is that and that was all of the flags so we got all the flags no no after you let me hold the door for you i insist you go first and user triggered persistence fuck the world so there is that, and we accomplished this fairly quickly. I think I'm actually, I'm pretty happy about the fact that this kind of finished as quickly as it did, and now we can move on to the next task. Okay, so task number seven is about login keys, and uh, or login screen, my bad, login screen and remote uh, desktop RDP in our case. So if we have physical access to the machine, or RDP, which is what we have. You can backdoor the login screen to access a terminal without having valid credentials for a machine. So there's two ways to do it. There's one, the sticky keys. So when you press Control Alt Delete, it locks the screen or it tries to lock the screen, right? And so you can configure Windows to use sticky keys, which allow you to press the buttons uh, of a combination sequentially instead of at the same time. In that case, if sticky keys are active, you could press and release control, then press and release alt and press release delete to achieve the same effect as doing control alt delete in a combination. So to establish uh, using sticky keys, we will abuse a shortcut by default in when installation and it's by doing shift five times. So you just press shift five times and then uh, it asks if you want to enable sticky, sticky keys and you say yes. So uh, when you do that, the binary that is being executed is this thing, okay? So 
if we want to replace the binary with a payload of our own, we can trigger it with the shortcut, which is what? Press shift five times, right? And you can even do this from the login screen before inputting any credentials. So a straightforward way to backdoor the login screen consists of replacing that executable with a copy of command line. That way, we can spawn a console using the sticky keys shortcut even from the login screen. So to overwrite this, we first need to take ownership of the file and grant our current user permission to modify it. Then we'll be able to replace it with a copy of command and we can do it with the following. So you take ownership, so take own of this file and then it'll say success, you got it. And then you do eye cackles to actually give yourself uh, administrator full privileges. So administrator, which it feels like administrator should have full privileges but you grant the administrator user full privileges. And then once you've done that, then you can copy the command line executable into this or instead of this. Essentially what you're doing is you're copying this on top of what this is already at. And then it's gonna say, do you wanna override it? You say, yeah, hell yeah, I wanna do it. And so you do that, then you can lock the session and then press shift five times. And then when you do that, a terminal is going to pop up and you should be able to get the flag. So from the new terminal, we don't even need to do a reverse shell or any kind of a payload. So that one's going to be fairly si uh, simple. And then we already talked about the utilities manager in, I think it was in gaining uh, privileges. So it's not in the part one of the persistence video, but it was the part, uh, it was the Windows uh, escalation video. So we already talked about the utilities manager and... Uh, it's basically when you click on this little button right here, it gives you these things right here, these like potential options. So what happens is it executes that with system privileges. And if we replace it with a copy of command, then we can bypass the login screen again and just go into the system using the system privileges using command line. So to replace it, we do a similar process of what we did before. You take first ownership of util utilities manager. You have the ownership, then you do eye cackles to give administrator full privileges and then you replace the uh, you replace util utilities manager with uh, command line and once you do that then you can again just go lock the screen and then instead when you click that it just opens up the new thing for us so this one's actually pretty straightforward and seems to be honestly really easy so uh, we should have absolutely no problems I think the only problem we're going to have is that the Windows machine is going to keep asking us to reconnect. So <laughs> that's kind of the only annoying thing that we're going to have to deal with. But look at that. <laughs> it already did it. So uh, there we go. So we're right here. Open up the command prompt and just run through the thing. So it's going to be pretty easy to do. So first, I'm just going to go into the root uh, folder. And we're just going to run everything from here. So take ownership of the file. So there you go. We took ownership of the, the sticky keys executable. And then we're going to change the permission using iCackles. And there you go. We gave permission to administrator, full permission. And now we're gonna copy the file into the place that we want it to go to. If only we actually get the connection long enough to be able to run it. That's, that's basically the only challenge, right? Oh no, what did I just do? What did I just do? 20 files copied to what? Oh my God, what did I just do? <laughs> No freaking way. I copied C windows. I guess I just copied all of those. It should be fine. <laughs> oh my God. That's hilarious. Okay. So copy C. Uh, let's do a directory and see what the hell we just did. Man, imagine if I messed the whole thing up by just accidentally pressing enter. That would be embarrassing. Let's see if it'll still work if I do it. So copy C, uh, Windows, System32, C, 
command.exe. <laughs> okay, cool. So uh, it looks like it worked, and I'm really hoping that I didn't mess everything up with that initial command. I don't know why they would put... Uh, see, this is there's so many things wrong with Windows, in my opinion, but we're not going to go there. Okay, so we're here. Now we've got to do shift five times. And we did. And here is our shell because it works like a charm. So don't, please just thank you. Oh my God, of course you did. Okay, let's go here. Let's lock it one more time. Oh, it's already here, great, okay. Okay, so there you go. Now I need to go get the flag. Which flag is it? It is flag 14. Okay, cool. Breaking through login, so there's that. All right, cool. So we were able to do that one. Now we're going to run a similar exercise with utilities manager. So uh, the first idea is to take ownership of the file, uh, which is the uh, it's inside Windows system 32 and it's called utilman.exe. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Uh, I misspelled Windows. OK, cool. So we have ownership of that file. Now we're going to change the permissions of the file. Cool. Administrator has full privileges. And now we're just going to copy it. Let me make sure I don't accidentally press enter on anything. Cool. And that has been fully copied as well. So now all I got to do is I got to go here and uh, what is it? Lock the screen. And then from here, just press utilities manager. And there is our new terminal window. And so it's going to be flag number 15 for this one. Cool. And there it is. The login screen is merely a suggestion. <laughs> and so there is that. And now we have our wonderful flag for flag number 15. And it's saying expiring soon, which I mean, I don't even understand why it's saying that. Because we've been here, we barely just got here. So why would it even tell us that? Okay, this thing is obnoxious. So hopefully we can be finished with this before the timer runs out. So we just finished the backdooring and uh, RDP. So now we're going to move on to the very last task before we conclude this room. All right, so there is persisting through existing services, and there's only two flags in this one, so it should be also another straightforward one. So using web shells. So uh, usually when you want to get persistence in a web server, you upload a web shell to the web directory. Uh, this is trivial, and it will grant access with the privileges of the configured user, which is by default app pool, default app pool. So it's, uh, it's not a... A big one especially uh, even if it's an unprivileged user it has the special se impersonate privilege providing an easy way to escalate to administrator using various known exploits for more information on how to abuse this privilege we can see the windows privilege escalation room which there's already a video that was done uh, let's just double check and make sure yeah we already did this video so you can see all of that in the windows privilege escalation room or video excuse me but so what we're going to do is first we're going to uh, download ASP.NET web shell and a ready to use one is provided here. But feel free to use any that you prefer. Transfer it to the victim machine and move it into the web root, uh, which by default is located here. Uh, once you have that, depending on the way that you create or transfer the shell, um, the permissions in the file may not allow the web server to access it. If you're getting a permission denied error while accessing the shell's URL, just grant everyone full permission on the file to get it working. And you can do so with iCackles grant everyone full permission. We can then run the command from the web server by pointing to the following URL, which is this thing. And that would be the shell. And it should look like this. And it should be a web shell for you. And so once we're here, we can just execute the command to get the flag number 16, which is basically the same command that we've been using this entire time. And we'll have that. And then so there's the MS SQL, Microsoft SQL, using that as a backdoor. Um, there are a lot of ways to, or several ways, I guess, to put backdoors. 
uh, to MSSQL server installations. For now, we're going to look at one of them that abuses triggers. So triggers in SQL allows you to bind actions to be performed when specific events occur. Those events can range from somebody logging in uh, to that data being inserted or updated or deleted from a given table. So a lot of different triggers. For this, we're going to create a trigger for any insert into the database. So before creating the trigger, we must first reconfigure a few things on the database. First, we got to enable the command shell XP stored procedure. Uh, it's a stored procedure that is provided by default in MSSQL and allows you to run commands directly in the system console, but comes disabled by default. So first you have to enable it. And to do it, you got to open Microsoft SQL Server Manager Studio 18 uh, from the start menu. Then when you ask for authentication, you just use Windows authentication, which is the default value. And you'll be logged in with the credentials of the current Windows user. By default, the local administrator account will have access to all databases. So once you're in, click on New Query to open the query editor and then run the following sequence uh, SL, SQL sequences to enable the advanced options and proceed to enable command shell. So this, I kind of, I think I had a little bit challenged with the first time around. I think you're supposed to run one line at a time. Uh, so you do this and then this and then this and then you do this, this and this. Um, after that, we have to ensure that the website is uh, website accessing the database can run this. So by default, only databases uh, by default only database users with the sysadmin role will be able to do so. Since it is expected that web applications use a restricted database user, we can grant privileges to all users to impersonate the system administrator user, which is the default database administrator. So use master and then grant impersonate on login to public, which is everybody. And then after all of that, <laughs> we want to configure a trigger. And so you change the database, right? So first you use the database and then you're going to create the trigger on these people for insert. So that's the command that we want to do or for insert as my bad. So that's the command that we're going to do and then execute as login system administrator uh, master xp command shell and powershell and this is the command that is going to be running and it's going to be the reverse shell to our attack box and so once that whole thing is set up uh, let's create a script called evil script ps1 in the attacker machine which will contain a powershell reverse shell which is going to be all of this, which we're basically just going to copy paste. And we're going to need two terminals to handle the connections. One, uh, the trigger will perform the first connection and download execute evil script. And it's for it's using port 8000 for that, which does it show right here? It, yeah, it does. So we're using port 8000 for that. And then the second will be a reverse shell on port 445 to the attacker machine, which is being done on netcat. So that's relatively simple, but I did, I do remember the first time I did this, I had a challenge. So hopefully I can just go through both of these tasks fairly simple. The first task is not as complicated, uh, which is this. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, let's just make sure that this is still connected, but I'm gonna restart the Windows machine just to give us a little bit uh, less of a problem as we're doing this. And then uh, once that is fully restarted, we're going to run the rest of these exercises. OK, so while the Windows uh, machine is loading, the first thing I want to do is I want to get that web shell that they're talking about. Um, and you can do it by literally clicking on that link and it's going to open up this uh, window for you on GitHub. And you basically just copy this entire code, right? You just copy all of this. And then now you have it. And now we can go inside here and run something as simple as nano uh, shell dot. I think it's ASPX is the ASPX. Yeah. So nano shell dot ASPX is going to be the extension of the file that we want to have. And so right here, we're just going to paste it in here. And that's it. That's literally the code, uh, the reverse shell for us anyways. And so you're going to control O to write it out, press enter, 
and then control X to close that out. And I, when I do that, I should have a shell.aspx available and it's right there. So once the Windows machine is up, we're going to transfer it to the Windows machine. So let's see if it's up. Okay, cool. So the Windows machine is up and we can now try to run the commands to actually transfer it in here. So uh, we're gonna, as usual, we're just gonna run Python 3 M HTTP server to create a web server for ourselves. And on here, we're going to run wget, um, where is it, HTTP 1010. I think it's still 190.155. I wanna make sure it is before I press enter. But it's shell.aspx, it's the name of the file. And it is shell.aspx, and it is 1010.190.155. So that is indeed the case. And so now we're going to output it into shell.aspx. And there you go. So if I run dir, I should see it and it's right there. So now I'm going to start uh, or move it, excuse me. I'm gonna move the shell.aspx into inet pub www root. And there you go, that's been moved as well. So now we want to grant everybody permission on this. So it says, depending on the way that you create it, the permissions may not allow the web server. So if you're getting a permission denied error while accessing the shell, uh, just grant everyone full permission on the file. So we're just gonna do that real quick. Just like that. So we granted the shell file uh, permission to everyone and now we should be able to run uh, the file using the machine IP and uh, the following URL it seems like right so it, it feels like it should be fairly straightforward in regards to that so let's see Yeah, so it seems like we could just do it using the machine IP, uh, the, not the attack box IP, but the regular machine IP. I don't know if I have to do it on Windows Explorer or if I have to do it, I feel like it, it's kind of pointless if we have to do it on the actual Windows Explorer from the local machine. So we should be able to do it from the attack box. So HTTP uh, 10, 10, 175, 90 and shell.aspx. Oh, I see, I think I know what happened. I think I know exactly what happened. So I did the move first and then I tried to change the permission, but it's not in this directory anymore. So I need to actually go into the directory that we moved it to first. So it's going to be uh, this directory. And then in here, there's probably a million. Oh, okay, there it is. So now in here, we're going to change the permission of the file because it's actually in here and we're going to grant everyone full permission. There you go, now it's been processed. So now hopefully it'll actually run. So let's see if it'll run here. Uh, okay, it won't run here, so let's see if it'll run here. It did run, all right. And so here we are going to see um, the flag, right? So flags flag 16.exe and do you, it might be possible for others to see that. Do you want to continue? Yes, continue. Oh, I'm missing a backslash, enter. There it is. We got it. Super excited that this actually worked. Okay, the key here is that we're supposed to use Internet Explorer on the same machine not the attack box, Mozilla Firefox. That's very important to understand. And it ran, it worked. I am excited about it. And you also should know that uh, the way that they've outlined the instructions in the room is that first they tell you to transfer the file, right? So first 
once you have downloaded the shell from the attack box, first they say move the shell into this directory. And so when you do that, if you're not in that directory, you can't run the change permission uh, command. So you have to actually be in that directory. So you need to CD, change directory to that directory. And then from there, you'll see that the file is actually in here. And then from there, you can change the permission of the file, grant everybody permission to do it. And just like that, it says that it works. And then you just saw what happens when you go into uh, Internet Explorer and actually run it. So that was awesome. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to do the uh, the MS SQL uh, for the back door. All right. To make that happen, we got to go into our little search bar and search for Microsoft SQL Server Management. There it is. Management Studio 18. And it will open that up for us. And we're going to run a few queries. OK, so that took a that took a little while to load up. Um, the specific uh, request that we or instructions, excuse me, that we got was to use the Windows authentication by default and just connect. And from there, we can go to this little button up here and create a new query. And from here, we're going to run a series of commands to be able to do what we want to do. So um, the first thing I wonder so run the following SQL sentences to enable the advanced options in MS SQL. OK, so the way that they have uh, written out the instructions, it kind of seems like you're supposed to do all of these separately. But I believe you can write this entire set of instructions and just run them as one execution. So you write the new query using that button and then you have to execute the whole thing. And so instead of doing one, two, three, so on and so forth, you can just write everything and then it links everything together, as you can see. And then when you press execute, and th this is a theory for me right now, because I'm still trying to make sure that everything I, I've done is correct. So I'm going to try to see if this actually works. And if it does, excellent. If not, uh, I'm going to go back to the drawing board, but this will be, serve as experience for you and extra knowledge for you so that you know what's going on. So we're going to create execute and see how that works. OK, so everything up until this point seems to have done well. Uh, what it says is that create trigger must be the first statement in a query batch. And so it was connected to all of this stuff. So let me see if I could just take this entire section and cut that and this should all be good i'm gonna see if, if it'll run yeah so that all of that ran correctly so i'm just gonna replace yeah all of that should be fine all of that is fine the it previously it was it went from zero to one but then it now went from one to one which means that the options have been saved that's one of the things so now i can paste on top of this basically what my original stuff was and it should be fine and there's no squiggly red lines saying that there anything's wrong so you run that and now it says commands completed successfully so uh, it was two separate batches of commands and everything before create trigger needs to be one batch of commands and then you execute that and then everything after create trigger will be your second batch of commands and then you can execute that. I'm sure there is a way that we could have separated them so that create trigger would just be its own first uh, line in the command, but I'm not too savvy on the queries of SQL. So I'm not, uh, I don't know fully what would that have to be. So we just did a quick little live trial and error and we got it. So that part is all good. So the next thing that we got to do is go to our attack box and from here, we're going to uh, create a script called the evil script PS1, because that's the script that we were referring to in our our little command right there. So in in this command right here, we are referring to this evil script PS1 thing right here that's being loaded on our IP address on port 8000. So we're going to go here 
Um, I'm going to exit this for now because I don't need it right now. And I'm going to do nano evil script dot PS1 to create an evil script. And I'm going to paste the evil script in here. The one thing that I do have to change is the attacker IP right there. So you got to kind of do your arrow keys to get over there. And then just make sure that you change your attacker IP. And apart from this, I think we can actually run the exploit after the fact. So 1010, 190, 155. And you do command O to write it and then command X to exit out and then LS and there it is evil script dot PS one. So we got that. And so now we need to open up two terminals. One of them is going to be the the Python server that's going to execute on port 8000. And then the other one is going to be the netcat uh, listener that's going to be listening back for this. And so the whole idea is that the trigger is going to perform the first connection to download and execute evil script. And it's going to use port 8000 for that. The second connection will be a reverse shell. And so with all of that ready, we're going to go to the IP address that they gave us and insert an employee into the web application. And that should give us the, the trigger so that we can get our reverse shell. So it was, a, it's kind of a, a little bit of a complicated one, honestly, but I mean, <laughs> Not a little bit. I'm going to be my, the first to admit that it, this actually was complicated. It was one of the most complicated. That's why it's the last task. And uh, for somebody that doesn't know anything about SQL or SQL queries, I can understand 100% why it would be so challenging. So there we go. We created our Python server for it to grab it. And we created our Netcat listener for it to be listening for that connection. So now we can go to the IP address here and it should just give us something that we can insert something into and we can't. So let me see if I'm supposed to do anything else. Okay, so maybe I'm supposed to do it inside the Windows machine. So I'm gonna load up the Internet Explorer again and we're gonna go into HTTP 10, 10, 244, 100. And it's going to be right here. All right, there you go. We got a security warning from Microsoft. So you just got to make sure that you add this IP address to the list of the approved IPs that it can go to. And so this is it. So this is our little SQL online web portal that we can add anybody into. So uh, all it's telling me is that I can just add uh, a person in here and it doesn't really even need to have all of the fields, but I'm just going to have all of the fields. Why not? So Hank Hackerson at port, we'll do extension 666 <laughs> and email is going to be Hank at hacker.com, whatever. And let's add that. Oh, well, there you go. I mean, yeah, I think it worked actually several times, but finally I got a connection received from here. Um, which means that it usually it shows something else like uh, it actually shows us what directory we're in or something so there you go okay it actually does work and we have our path so now we can just execute the uh, flags dot flag or not dot excuse me flag 17.exe there you go I live in your database that's a crazy one um, so I pressed uh, this add button several times and I didn't know that it had been working every single time. So clearly you see that each time it did work, it just took, uh, I guess, a little while for the connection to be received. And once we did receive the connection, because it didn't show this right away, it doesn't show this thing immediately. Uh, because that didn't show, I didn't know that it was there. I was looking for this to confirm that I had the connection. Um, but because it didn't show, I went back and I clicked the uh, submit a couple of more times. And then I noticed all of these signals and I was like, oh, maybe it is connected. And it gave me this line. And I was like, oh, it is actually connected. So we did receive our connection. And the first thing that I did was print, print working directory and it gave me the working directory. And then I just, I was able to execute the flag. And so we got the flag and we finished. And so I'm honestly, I'm very happy that this worked because I 
the first time that I did this, when I did this on my own, it did not work as smoothly <laughs> as this did. So pretty excited about this one. And uh, we can now close everything out and move on because we are officially done. I'm going to terminate this machine and I'm going to terminate this machine. And if you made it all the way to the end of this task, I am very, very proud of you. I hope you learned a lot from this. And uh, hopefully you actually were able to complete the exercises as well. And hopefully this actually helped you. So um, I'm glad that you stuck it out. And honestly, I'm very glad that I made it to the end myself. <laughs> all right. In conclusion, uh, we basically covered some primary methods for establishing persistence on a machine. Uh, you could say persistence is the art of planting backdoors on a system while going undetected for as long as possible without raising suspicion. So we have seen a lot of different ways. Uh, we've seen some that rely on different operating system components, providing various ways to achieve long-term access to a compromised host. And while we have shown several techniques, we've only covered basically the tip of the iceberg and there's all of this other stuff that I know I haven't done. Um, so I'm excited to be able to get to those rooms and get those done as well. So it's going to be very, very exciting to actually kind of continue down this path of persistence. Oh, this isn't even on try hackney. So this is one of those things that is self-study. All right, with that being said, we have now wrapped this room officially. I think this was the first one that was a two-part video. So it was a monster of a room. And uh, it is only available to, to VIP subscribers or paid subscribers on Try Hack Me. So it does require that you have the paid subscription to it. If you click the link in the description below, then you'll get a $5 credit or $5 discount towards your paid subscription. And it's 12 bucks to start, so you get the $5 off. It makes it 7 bucks, super affordable. And you get access to all of the machines and all the rooms and so on and so forth. So it's very, very, in my opinion, it's a great deal. I love it. That's why I keep doing videos on it. And that's why it kind of inspired me to share a lot of these things because I had some tough times as I was going through some of the first rounds for a lot of these, especially this room. So I know that it can be useful for people. And I just think that it's a very, very useful service to try hack me service as you can hopefully tell by now so uh, if you don't want to do that if you don't want to use try hack me you're more than welcome to do this on your own machines and get your own linux set up and uh, get you know or even unix i think because unix and linux are very similar to each other um, and then use a windows machine to do as your as your victim and you're more than welcome to do all of that it's it basically runs the same way and if you have kali linux you'll have all of the MSF uh, Venom and all of those things pre-installed onto it because it's uh, it's mainly used for penetration testing and ethical hacking. So um, you're more than welcome to do that. And if you like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell, then you'll actually get notified the next time a video comes out and you can just follow along on your own or just use those videos as your walkthroughs for the Try Hack Me rooms. In either case, you know, it would be awesome to have you as a part of the community. Thankfully, the community has been growing and I'm very, very excited and it's really nice to hear the feedback that I get in the comments and uh, I would be more than happy, I mean, I would be ecstatic to hear, to hear from you uh, in the comments. So if you have any questions, please let me know. If you have any uh, anything that you like covered in future videos, please let me know. Or if you just want to say hi and if you want to give a shout out, please let me know that all of that makes me smile and it makes me feel awesome about doing all of this. So it means more than you know. Believe me, it, it really does mean more than you know when you leave those comments. It's very, it's like fuel to keep going. So I want to thank you in advance for actually doing that. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's your boy Hank Hackerson at Hank Hacks Hackers. And I really hope that you got some value from this video. If no one else loves you, Hank loves you. And peace, love, and chicken grease. And I'll see you in the next video. Later.